Now, uh, when they got to Plymouth, they, um, they started in uh, about Christmas time and starting to build some houses and things, which, of course, was a slow work, and they had to wade through the water to get on and off of the boats uh, back and forth from the Mayflower. And um, they started to get sick, partly because they didn't have very good food. Probably some of it was scurvy, and uh, maybe their bodies were just weakened by uh, the tremendous uh, difficulties of the crossing from the ocean. It was not uncommon when people first came across the ocean for a number of people to die, uh, not so much dying on the trip, but when they got over, partly because of food, nutrition, and, and various types of sicknesses. And um, so uh, as uh, December rolled along, they had, uh, of their 102, we had uh, uh, six people died. And then in January, another eight people died. Of course, it's cold, and they're trying to build the buildings. At one time, uh, they had one of the buildings built. They had people with blankets that were going to sleep in the building, and all of a sudden, somebody yells, fire, and the whole grass roof of the building was on fire. Inside the building, they had open barrels of gunpowder, and the sparks are starting to come down from the ceiling that's on fire. And they grabbed the gunpowder, ran out into the night, and uh, didn't escape with too much of their uh, blankets or clothing. But fortunately, no one was blown up or killed, and uh, so it was a very difficult time. By the time uh, January, uh, January, there were eight that died. February, 17 people died, sometimes as much as uh, three or four people in a day. And in March, another 13 died. So now you're starting with about 102 pilgrims, and you've gotten uh, in total about 47 had died. And uh, when you take a look at that, uh, you must uh, be thinking a little bit in your own mind. Look, uh, uh, you know, John Robinson, our pastor, had a beautiful vision for what we're going to accomplish here. And we thought God wanted us to come to this new land. But now look, almost half of us have died uh, this is kind of discouraging. Uh, we didn't complain when we were cast about inside the great room of the Mayflower as we were tossed in the oceans. And, um, and yet now half of us have, have died. And if you take a look down the list, you find that, uh, that of the daughters, there were uh, seven daughters. None of them died. Of the little boys, there were 13 little boys. Uh, three of them died. Well, the reason the children didn't die so much is because the mothers had been sacrificing. Of the 18 mothers, 13 of them died. And in the middle of the night, so that the Indians wouldn't think that the uh, pilgrims were weak, in the middle of the night, sometimes they would take their dead and drag them out across the frozen ground and try to scrape out with their hands a shallow grave of rocks and leaves and things to cover up uh, their dead and the dead bodies. And so it was a very, very grim time. And um, when you think about the story of the pilgrims, it's a great story in terms of adventure, in terms of vision, but also in terms of the terrible suffering that these people uh, underwent here, uh, not only in coming across the ocean, but having half of them almost die in these, these first four months. And uh, it just seemed like death had them in its grip until about mid-March when they made their first sort of face-to-face, -face, if you will, encounter with an Indian. And it was, uh, again, just like everything else of the pilgrims, it's bigger than life. You picture, here it is, mid-March, and somebody yells from the wall, Indian coming. Well, you must have got that wrong. You mean Indians? No, Indian coming. And you look out, and here coming right up to the blockhouse is this tall, stately, dignified Indian, nothing on but his loincloth. He walks right into the blockhouse and right up to the leader and says, Welcome. And they're thinking, how did this guy learn to speak English? And uh, they're kind of taken aback. Uh, welcome, they said. His next words were, do you have any beer? That was kind of surprising to them too as well. They said, where did this guy find out about how to speak English and whether they had beer or not? Well, it turned out they were out of beer, but they did have some brandy. So he sat down and helped himself to the brandy and to the roast duck and had a very nice large meal. They kept asking him questions about the local Indians and he didn't say a word until he'd had a nice big square meal. Then later on, they find out who the Indian was. His name was Samoset. Samoset was a sachem or a chief of the Algonquins up in Maine. And it seems that he had the concept of going from Maine down south in the wintertime and he had uh, 
bummed a ride from a, an English sea captain down the coast. He had learned to speak English and um, had stopped to spend the winter with Massasoit down in Massachusetts. So he'd gone from Maine to Massachusetts, and um, when he heard about the pilgrims, he decided to go pay them a visit. And so their first contact was actually an Indian from Maine, Samoset, a great man. And he told them that uh, the Indian chieftain in the area, his name was Massasoit. He was a great chieftain, and he ruled over quite a number of the Indians, but the main tribe was 50 miles to the southeast, some considerable distance away. They asked him about whose land they were on, and they, he said, well, this land used to belong to the Pawtuxets, a very warlike tribe that had been completely destroyed in a plague. And so that was several years before. So the land that they found didn't belong to anybody, and the other Indians thought it was cursed. So they'd have nothing to do with that particular place. So they found, by God's providence, uh, the, perhaps the one or only uh, area on the eastern seaboard where they had cleared land, beautiful water, good place for defense, and nobody claimed the land. And uh, so that's what they had found uh, almost uh, by God's providence, of course. 